All right, our next panel is on managing SEC-related criminal investigations and prosecutions. And uh, we have a really strong uh, panel to, to discuss this today. And let me start by introducing Kit Adelman, who's a partner at Haynes & Boone in Dallas. Kit served for over 20 years at the SEC in the Atlanta, Fort Worth, Denver, and Philly offices, including as regional director in Atlanta. Welcome, Kit. Uh, next to her is Greg Casper. He is uh, currently regional trial counsel in the SEC's Denver office, where he served for over 13 years. Greg, thanks for joining us. Al Cook, uh, partner at King & Spaulding in D.C. He previously served for nearly 14 years in the Enforcement Division uh, in D.C., where he was an assistant director. Uh, to his neck, other side of him is Steve Scholes. He's a partner at McDermott, Will and Emery here in Chicago, the global head of that firm's litigation practice group, and he too is a former counsel in the Enforcement Division. Finally, uh, very pleased to have with us today Jason Yonan, a chief of the Securities and Commodities Fraud Section at the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, here in the Northern District of Illinois. And he previously served as senior counsel in the SEC's Enforcement Division as well. Jason supervises six AUSAs who focus on securities and commodities and other investment frauds. Uh, Steve, take it away. Okay, thanks, Bruce, and uh, uh, welcome, everybody. We've got uh, a great panel, a lot of material to cover here on a very uh, timely topic, so we appreciate you all being here, and I will tell you personally, it's a great honor to be, to be uh, on the panel with these very uh, distinguished practitioners. So let's just uh, jump right in. We're gonna talk about what is commonly referred to as a parallel proceeding, or maybe a joint proceeding, uh, which can include uh, mere investigations or may also include actually, actually uh, filed contested enforcement actions. But maybe right off the top, Jason, why don't, why don't we jump in and, and you talk about the distinction between a joint proceeding and a parallel proceeding? Sure. Um, that you know, from the government's perspective, we conduct parallel investigations. At times, uh, courts have ruled that our investigations with the SEC are what are called joint investigations. Uh, the practical effect of that is that may, uh, it may have additional discovery requirements for the government, and, and the government meaning the Department of Justice and the SEC. So for, for example, if we are conducting an investigation uh, and the SEC is conducting a parallel investigation as well, and we conduct interviews together, uh, a court may say that that, is a, that part of the investigation is a joint investigation. And the effect of that is, if the SEC, for example, is taking notes during that interview, me, the Department of Justice, and the people that I work with will have to look at that material to determine whether it may, might be discoverable in the government's case, whether that's Brady or, or Giglio material. So if an investigation is found by a court to have been a joint investigation, uh, there may be additional discovery requirements for the Department of Justice and for, and for the FBI uh, to look, potentially, you know, communicate with the SEC about, you know, did they take notes and stuff like that. Okay, th thanks, Jason. More, more to come on that distinction because it's very, I think, important from a, a defense perspective and can provide leverage uh, for the defense at, uh, at some points <laughs> along the line. But, but let, let's first chat just a little bit about um, in a parallel or a joint proceeding, kind of what gives rise to these. I think um, you know we're, we're, we're all familiar with them. They can arise from uh, a corporate crisis, a parent, uh, a parent sort of relatively bad misconduct, if you will, accounting restatements. There's a lot of event-driven investigations, wildfires in California, a train wreck in Ohio. Uh, they can arise in a lot of different. Uh, facts and circumstances, but typically what we're referring to is an investigation by the SEC, an investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, in many events there will be uh, a parallel civil litigation, a class case, class cases, uh, a derivative action, maybe even investigations by a state criminal or administrative authorities. And layered on top of all of that, you can get a board appointed special litigation committee to conduct an internal investigation. So these are uh, multi-tiered, multi-layered, involved just a wide variety of very sensitive strategic considerations, which we hope uh, to tease out for you a little bit today. But Kit, maybe as a preliminary matter, 
Or give, give us sort of your perspective and your practice on, um, you know, are, are, are these things increasing in frequency? Is it about the same number? What, what, what are you seeing? Are they more and more, less and less, or is it remaining fairly constant? Um, my own impression over the last couple of years is that the number of joint or parallel investigations um, is increasing. And, you know, to sort of prove our point, Steve, we were talking earlier and saying, you know, we find this more and more common than we did, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, you know, the Global Investigations Research Group, Global Investigations Report, GIR, can't remember exactly what the R stands for, uh, has reported that it is more and more frequent. I think some of it occurs because of more DOJ task forces, more SEC specialized units, all of those that are focused on rather significant crimes. Um, I also note, you know, the SEC um, has a lot of either big matters or very small matters, right? Marketing rule violations, failing to have policies and procedures, um, off-channel communications, those kinds of things that don't go criminal. And there's this kind of gap of things we used to see. I'd like to think it's because the law's better, right? Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank, all those kinds of things made it tougher for the kind of middle range. So it's either people who seem to be doing really bad things or the low-end kind of foot faults, broken windows. And the more you have those big cases, the more interested the Department of Justice is. So I think it's been anecdotal from my experience. I know from Steve's as well, but you know, supported by um, the literature as well. Okay, Th thanks, uh, Kit. That, that's that's helpful, Jason. Maybe uh, we should try to lay a foundation here uh, as the basis for our, the, the rest of our conversation with respect to the Department of Justice's policy with respect to parallel proceedings that governs the, uh, the conduct, the behavior of uh, US attorney's offices in the field in one of these circumstances. Sure, so the department does have a policy uh, addressing parallel proceedings. You know, We're talking here about parallel proceedings with the Securities Exchange Commission, but there are all sorts of other parallel proceedings. There's parallel proceedings with the CFTC. There's parallel proceedings even within the Department of Justice. You know, the civil division of the of the U.S. Attorney's Office might have an interest in a matter, let's say a healthcare matter or something of that nature. But we do have policies and procedures for you know how we intake these cases, uh, how we you know investigate these cases, how we resolve the cases. Um, in particular, I think the the biggest issue that often comes up, and this is a fairly recent. Uh, change to how parallel proceedings uh, are resolved is we are supposed to, under the guidelines, take into effect you know, potential penalties in other civil or regulatory matters when resolving a department case. I think on the defense side, that's often referred to sort of the anti-piling on policy that we're supposed to consider you know, the egregiousness of the conduct, the effectiveness of a sanction in a criminal case, and, and sort of federal law enforcement interest to determine you know, what the result should be in the criminal matter, if there should be a you know, criminal case going forward, or if it should be left to the civil regulators to deal with. So we do have policies and procedures for you know, how we take these cases in and how we resolve them. And we also have ethical responsibilities when it comes to these parallel proceedings, because we can't, you know, as a Department of Justice, use the, criminal, use the civil investigation as sort of a cover for the criminal case. Like if, 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 our, if our parallel proceedings with the SEC, the SEC has to be taking steps to, to further their case. They can't be working sort of for us to further, further the Department of Justice's case. Okay, thanks Jason. Greg, what about uh, uh, for the SEC? Does the SEC have any kind of, of, of policy or practices for uh, conducting an investigation parallel to the Department of Justice? Uh, yeah, Steve. So uh, first off, I am also obliged to give my disclaimer as an SEC uh, employee. My comments today are provided in my official capacity as the Regional Trial Counsel of the SEC's Denver office, but do not necessarily reflect the views of the Commission, the Commissioners, or other members of the staff. Um, and you know, you know, yes, the SEC has. You know, this is a thing that comes up, and we have policies for everything, so that the, including this. So. Um, <laughs> And obviously, there are times like you know the examples you've mentioned, and just you know far more mundane things as well, where the both the SEC and the Department of Justice have occasion to be investigating the same sets of facts, and you know we don't you know it's not like we uh, you know refrain necessarily from investigating something because the Department of Justice has an interest or vice versa. Um, 
but you know the the investigation is you know still governed by what's in the best interest of our client, the commission, and you know we make our own you know making our own charging decisions and. You know, when we see it, you know, in addition, you know, to the, you know, in a variety of cases, it, you know, it definitely is something that comes up. Um, in addition to like the types of things you mentioned, I think the things that I've seen the most in my practice is, is insider trading cases, I think, or head and shoulders, the thing I've seen it the most in, but also uh, some market manipulation cases and offering fraud cases as well. So it's, you know, it's definitely something that's, you know, well trod for sure. Are there, are there any limits on your ability to cooperate one with another in pursuing an investigation? The, the limits are mostly on the Department of Justice's end. We can't share uh, grand jury material with the SEC. Um, it, that's largely the, the big you know, no-no. Um, that we, They're able to give us access requests, and we're able to get access to a lot of the SEC's files. But the big sort of... Um, you know, landmine is we, we have to be careful about grand jury material. I mean, and the other limit that, you know, you mentioned before, Jason, is is that, you know, neither, you know, DOJ nor the SEC can take an action that's solely for the purpose of benefiting, you know, you know in our case, doing something that would only, that the only possible benefit would be to aid, you know, your investigation and, and vice versa. So, you know, that also um, is a limitation, I think. Okay, good. Uh, thanks. So, Greg, when you're, well, in what circumstances would you consider making a referral uh, to the U.S. Attorney's Office or, you know, Jason mentioned granting access to your files? What's your thought process in determining when that's appropriate and when it might not be efficient or effective? Well, I mean, Steve, you know, it's, uh, you know, the threshold obviously is that we believe that there's, you know, you know, there is or likely could be evidence of a crime being committed, right? The, the you know, the, the statutes aren't entirely the same, but, um, and then, you know, so we consider the egregiousness of the conduct, and then we also think about, you know, what if any, um, you know, you know, what if, there, if we refer the matter, what if any benefit does that provide, you know, the investors that we're charged with, you know, protecting? So it's, you know, it's sort of a case by case, you know, very, you know, practical consideration, but the first level is like the types of cases, you know, that Kit mentioned that are really foot faults. We're not thinking about those as being referrals, but things where we believe that it's not just that the securities laws have been violated, but there's been a crime committed as well. We are more likely to pick up the phone and try and make that referral. Is there a distinction at the SEC between what I'll call a formal uh, referral and I'll use the phrase Jason used, uh, an access, where, where the SEC grants access to its files, the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yeah, I mean, I think those, you know, Steve, are really separate things, right? If we get an access request, there's a, you know, a series of steps we go through, but it's typically, you know, we're able to grant it, and that's really just, you know, the Department of Justice being aware that we, you know, have some pieces of paper or whatever we have that they would like to see for whatever their purposes are. And we are typically able to accommodate that. You know, the referral is more of a, you know, is a more of a formal thing and typically requires, you know, you know, the you know, the senior leadership in the regional offices or people in the home office to be involved to make those decisions where we, you know, pick up the phone and say we think this is something that you should be involved in. Great. Thanks. So so Jason, you're getting access to their files, you're getting referrals from time to time. Do you ever whistle the SEC in, or is it kind of a one-way street? No, absolutely. We have referred cases to the SEC. That is actually more of a more recent trend, and I think that's just more of having a dedicated unit that focuses on securities commodities fraud. We are always out looking for, for cases, looking at things that we should be investigating. And in the course of doing that, we have found stuff that we call over to the SEC. SEC will open an investigation, and we'll have parallel investigations. So, most of the referrals flow from the SEC to the Department of Justice, but we have had in the last several years cases that we've, I've called over normally to the Chicago office of the SEC to say, you know, we're opening something up on this. You, you may want to also take a look at it. Okay. Uh, uh, that, that's great. Do you, do you ever, um, when, when, when you're deciding whether to go to the grand jury or not, that is to conduct an investigation, through the grand jury process or outside the grand jury, does, does the factor of whether or not you might want to share information with the SEC enter into that decision? It does. Um, you know, if we obviously go to that grand jury process, we're not able to share any of that information with the SEC. So that's certainly something that we take into account. You know, at what point is this going to become a grand jury investigation? At what point are 
we going to be walled off from having conversations about certain materials with the SEC? So that is something we will certainly take into account. I think it's uh, mitigated a little bit because you know, the SEC can give an access request to the Department of Justice and they can sort of share their information with us. And uh, I think that makes it easier for us to not necessarily have to run to the grand jury or issue grand jury subpoenas or something like that. Okay. Uh, Alec, from a defense perspective, uh, we're going to move to the side of Sure. Kind of justice and righteousness and right here for, 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 for a About change. About time. We yeah, have 28 exactly. minutes to go. Um, uh, do, do, you ever, do you ever keep your sort of eyes open, your antenna up for potential abuse in a parallel proceeding? Uh, what's the, from a defense perspective, what do you keep your eye on when you're involved in one of these things? Yes, I think you have to, but I think generally, at least my experience, you know, is that the teams from the two agencies are are doing what these guys have said. Uh, you know, they are working in parallel. They're not doing things, you know, at the direction of or solely for the benefit uh, of the other agency. I think the tricky part. Uh, for the defense is, you know, when maybe you're dealing with the SEC and the DOJ is in the background and you're not, you might have, uh, you know, a suspicion that they're there, uh, but you don't know for sure, uh, and you've got to deal with deal with the SEC. Uh, so that that's where I think it becomes tricky. I don't really think of that as an abuse uh, so much as just something that you've got to try to navigate. But, but would, would you, are, is one of the things you're sensitive to, one of the things that Jason alluded to early, at least the possibility, just keep an eye out uh, to, to, try, to try to make sure the civil proceeding by the SEC is not being used to conduct a criminal investigation? Sure, yeah, for sure. That, okay. Yeah, All right, absolutely. Um, so Kit, well, well, let me ask you, uh, Greg's investigating one of your clients, and you're not really sure whether Jason may be involved or not, but you think there's a possibility. Would you, would you ever just say, hey, Greg, is Jason involved, the U.S. Attorney's Office involved here? What, what are we dealing with? Can you, can you tell me whether or not there's a criminal investigation in addition to your own? Yeah, very often we ask that question. I think um, in some instances you have to be careful, right? If you think there isn't a criminal investigation, you don't want to signal to the SEC that you think there should be, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a, not a great idea. But um, in most of those sort of bigger name, bigger uh, appeal cases, uh, asking that question I think is a good idea. Okay. So I was tempted to ask whether or not you expect a straightforward answer. That seemed a little too blunt. So do, do, you, do you expect Greg or, or folks at the SEC to, be, to, to feel free enough to be able to, to, to give you kind of an honest and open answer to that question? I mean, do you, really, do you really expect him to tell you if there is one? Well, so, I mean, I spent long enough at the commission to know that the right answer, right, what the policies and procedures, as uh, Greg was pointing out, there are a lot. The, right answer is for them to tell me to look at the form 1662 and that there is the routine use to share with the criminal agencies, that sort of thing. And once we get past that, then we ask the question of, right, but are you aware of any? And they'll say, well, you'll need to call the, the Department of Justice. And I'll say, what office of the Department of Justice? Which AUSA office? Is there a specific person? Those kinds of things. And I think according to policy, and, and Greg can speak more about this, right? They're not supposed to give us the name unless the criminal authorities have said it's OK to share the name. Um, but the encouragement that I like to give to the SEC folks is it's going to simplify the process, right? If we can share information with both agencies simultaneously, if we can bring witnesses in for joint proffers, if I can do attorney proffers to both agencies, um, then you don't have to go through the process of now calling up Jason and saying, okay, this is what we got. Let me catch you up on that. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why I think it's a good idea and to push the staff to do that, but know that the policies and procedures uh, don't really make that easy to get an answer from the SEC staff. Okay, it's Greg. It's nice dealing with people like Kid because she can do my job as well as her own. <laughs> I was just going to ask you to grade her answer. I guess you got it pretty close pretty to right. Good. Okay, good. Yeah, you just saved us five minutes. That's fant that's fantastic. So, Jason, what do you expect Greg to tell Kit when Kit 
ask Greg if you're involved. Sorry about that. No, uh, so Kit got it right. Like generally speaking, our we we feel like we should be disclosing <laughs> that there's a criminal investigation. That's not the SEC's information to give out. But the SEC is very good at saying. Here's what our 1662 says. You should assume that there's an investigation, and uh, you can call so and so. And I've gotten to Kit's point. I've gotten calls before from defense attorneys where I'm like, "What are we talking about? I'm not. I haven't heard about anything about this from the SEC, but now I'm interested." So, um, but you know, there's a there's that seems a like a higher risk move than suggesting <laughs> to the SEC that maybe you think there's criminal exposure. That's right. It's calling around to the U.S. Attorney's office that's looking for somebody to investigate your client. But, but that's I'll, what we call business development. <laughs> <laughs> but the sort of larger point is, like, generally speaking, if the SEC has an investigation and you're aware of that investigation, there isn't a whole lot of reasons for me to be, like, hiding in the background. Like, uh, there's not a lot of covert right. action that can be taken if the SEC has an open and active investigation. So if uh, a lot of times I will tell the SEC staff that we're working with, you know, they'll just go ahead and tell them that we have an investigation, give them my name and number, and you know, then this begins as a, a joint investigation where you know we're moving on our I shouldn't say joint investigation, <laughs> parallel investigation. <laughs> we're moving on our parallel paths, and the defense is aware of it, and they can make decisions accordingly. Okay. I mean, Jason, there are times I, in my experience though where um, you know the criminal authorities still are, you know, have not surfaced and very much don't want to be surfaced. And even though, you know, that we've kind of stumbled into something and, you know, probably I imagine they would tell us that they would rather we wouldn't have done what we had already done, but we have. And so they, you know, do not want to be, have their numbers given out. You know? Yep. That, I, that is probably more of an office by office thing. I, generally not the case at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. There could be circumstances where that is the case, but you know, my view on it is if the SEC is is out there, defense is aware of the SEC, there is very little for me to gain by being like, well, there's no criminal investigation. If there's a criminal investigation, we tell them there's a criminal investigation. Okay. Okay. That's, fan that's fantastic. Thanks. Let's turn now for a little bit to what I'll loosely call discovery issues. I think we can all agree from a defense perspective, when you're involved in one of these th things, access to information is just a huge issue or maybe more accurately said, your lack of access to information you know, is a very, very big factor. But let's try to lay a little groundwork here. Jason, what are your, how, how are you able to gain information in, in you know, an investigation um, you know, in, in order to determine whether you think uh, you know, somebody should be indicted? So a lot of a variety of different ways. The, the biggest way, especially in a non-parallel investigation case, is through the use of grand jury subpoenas. Uh, but, you know, in a case where there is a parallel investigation, we may be getting information from the SEC pursuant to an access request. We may be executing search warrants, and search warrants can be search warrants of somebody's residence, somebody's business, someone's email account, someone's various social media accounts. Uh, there's other various types of, um, you know, orders that we could obtain, get judicial approval for, to obtain about you know phone records and things like that, email records that, that don't amount to a search warrant, uh, knock and talks, approaching people, FBI, knocking at people's door. Those are the, the primary ways in a financial investigation where we would be getting access to information. Okay, uh, that, that that's great. Um, Greg, what about you? You you got an investigation going. What do you what are your investigatory tools? How do you get information? Well, the, you know, the principal tools that we have is that we have administrative subpoenas we can issue for documents and testimony, right? And those are the things that we are able, you know, that we use, you know, the most day to day. And um, once, a, you know, the commission has authorized us to conduct an investigation um, and, you know, and especially the testimony, you know, we, you know, we really have, you know, pretty, you know, broad powers to, you know, to bring people in as many times as we need to and over time and so forth. Um, I think the you know one of the things that's you know you know probably of note is you know kind of what are the things that the SEC you know get, you know regularly can get access to that that you know the Department of Justice or U.S. Attorney's Office you know typically doesn't have and I think that's mostly I mean it's partly what Rachel alluded to earlier today is you know we have a ton of access to trading data of all different kinds and we have people that are. You know, devoted to that's their job is to sit around looking for it and looking, you know, to find information, you know, reflecting, you know, patterns or something that reflects, um, you know, violations of law. 
Um, and, you know, which is not something that, you know, DOJ has. And so that is something that we end up uh, referring, um, you know, the where we end up, you know, um, referring uh, cases to the uh, Department of Justice based upon that work. Alec, what about from a defense perspective? You've got a client who's uh, subject to an investigation by Greg and Jason, how, how, do you co how do you collect and gather information? Yeah, well, I think it depends a little bit on the nature of the client, right? If you're dealing with uh, an entity or a corporate client, then you've got access to a lot of information. You know, you can conduct an internal investigation. You can interview your own employees. You can review all your own records. And uh, you may not know what they're getting in uh, the phone records or getting from other sources, but you should have a good handle on on you know what's within in the realm of the knowable for the company. Uh, if you're representing an individual, then you've got more limited ability to gather information. You're going to be reliant on what the company and its counsel will share with you, what you can gather from you know joint defense communications or you know other witnesses being willing to to talk to you uh, either directly or through their counsel. And so, uh, I think you know the the most informational disadvantage is when you're representing an individual. Uh, is it is it fair to say, or is it too simple to say, that while, while you may have you may have access to some information, the information to which you have access is really a function of what your client knows or controls, whether it's a corporate client or an individual subject to joint defense communications and cooperation with other lawyers? Is that yes? Re yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you can't I think state you, the obvious. You can't compel. You can't compel anything. So uh, you know, if it's not within the realm of what you control, then you've got to rely on people cooperating with you to to help you develop your knowledge of the facts. Okay, so so let's talk from let's switch from investigations now to to a to a, a pending case. What's your ability to conduct discovery in a SEC enforcement proceeding filed in an Article Three court? Subject to the federal rules of civil procedure, as compared to representing a defendant in a in a, in a criminal case, an well, indicted criminal case. Well, at that point, then you've you've got you know pretty broad latitude to conduct discovery. You you can you know send out document requests and subpoenas. You can depose uh, the SEC as witnesses, and they actually have to be cross-examined in a way that they don't get cross-examined during investigative testimony. So if you're in a civil SEC case, you've got Pretty broad ability to gather evidence, you know, less so on the criminal side, but but you know, you know in the SEC context, you, it, know, so you let can me gather a lot. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Let, no. let me ask: Is is it fair to say that in an, in an investigation you don't have compulsory process, and in a civil case you have greater discovery tools than you do in a criminal case? Is that fair? Is it? I, I, I think but directly you know, correct. Yeah, yeah, at least in my experience, yes. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, there was a case that got a fair amount of discussion on the last panel that we're involved in defending, and you know, we have less ability to go out and, and you know, conduct discovery in that criminal case. So if you have a parallel case, do you ever consider trying to discover the criminal case through the civil case? I, I, in my experience, you... you talk about it and you talk about how great that might be and how they won't think it's coming and and then you ultimately decide that it's not going to be such a smart idea after all because your clients then also going to have to answer a bunch of questions in the civil case uh, so I at least in my experience on this side uh, you know when we've been dealing with a parallel proceeding the, the SEC cases ended up being stayed and and we've been generally fine with that because while we would have liked the opportunity to, to depose some of the the DOJ's witnesses in the civil case the the downside of that you know probably outweighed the potential upside okay hold the thought on the stays we're gonna yep. go, we're gonna get, get there in I know minute. that's later in the no, that's okay that's yeah, okay don't, don't, jump don't, 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 don't worry Steve, on the yeah. on the Civil side, one help that you have for the criminal case is also just the basic Rule 26 disclosures, right? The SEC is going to turn over its files, and so there is a certain amount of discovery that even if you're reluctant to issue um, requests of any kind for written responses, interrogatories, more documents, whatever it is, 
um, or to take other witnesses, you still get a lot more information um, than you usually have in response to a Wells notice. And even when the staff gives you access to everything they think is relevant, um, they have to turn over everything in the civil proceeding. And is there ever a circumstance in a civil case where you might think, well, my goodness, Jason's got access to the grand jury. He's got FBI agents running all, all over the place. So I'm going to get this federal rule of civil procedure discovery going. I'm going to figure out what's going on in this criminal case. Let's go get them. Why, why would, you well, ever, would you ever take that tack? Sure. Separate when apart from the overlap, yeah. right? I mean, when the cases mirror each other in terms of what the allegations are, what the facts are, you may start to take some of those steps. But as Alex said, that's a hard decision to make because the turnaround and requiring your client to sit for a deposition um, is problematic. And I know Fifth Amendment is also on our, out, our outline later, but that's the biggest issue. Do you, what's he going to do in the civil proceeding um, when there is a pending criminal proceeding? You, does, yeah. does it make a difference if your client in the civil case is going to be subject to a civil deposition under the auspices of the federal rules of civil procedure? You can't stop it. There's no stay. In that circumstance, would you would you would you go ahead and maybe conduct a little more, a little more discovery, be a little more aggressive, trying to figure out what's going on, on the criminal side? To when I say try to figure out what's going on, on the criminal side, I mean just it, just try to discover the facts and circumstances. Try to know what Jason knows in his secret grand jury proceeding that he won't tell you about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think part of it is um, you know the old Beatles song, right? I get by with a little help from my friends. Um, the issue of being able, in the investigation and in the civil proceeding, to talk with the colleagues that you know from these conferences and others, and talk to them about what their witnesses said or are planning to say, if they'll share it in the criminal proceeding, um, trying to get that kind of information is usually safer than issuing a deposition subpoena and doing that formally. So, you know, will, your, will you tell me what your client said? OK, that's good. What's better? Will your client sit down with us and talk about what they said or are planning to say or what you've heard from the DOJ, whatever that is? OK. Steve, I think a lot of times that, that option gets taken away by Jason, because yeah. he'll be in before any of this gets going and, you know, and, now, and seeks to stay in the case. Yep. Boy, did you, I, that was my best line of the panel, and you just stole it. So, <laughs> uh, no, I just didn't. So, <laughs> Before this is over with, I'm going to have Alec and Kit talked into conducting a bunch of discovery in this in the civil case. Okay, <laughs> uh, I mean they're 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 just running roughshod over. They're taking depositions. They're yeah, uh, uh, doing doing all sorts of things. Interrogatories. Are you worried about that? Do you care? I mean, it kind of seems like they can't conduct discovery anyway. Why why wouldn't you just in the interest of justice? Why wouldn't you let them find out what happened? So we will often make a motion to stay the civil case. Um, Look, we give it a lot of thought. If a defense, a defendant is like, I want to litigate against the government on two fronts, like, you know, I don't, I, I don't know if that's a good idea, but we do give it a lot of thought. But, you know, the civil rules or the criminal rules do not give access to the defendant, give, ac give the defendant access to our witnesses. And what we don't want is them getting access to our witnesses through the civil process. So in those situations, I think the case law is favorable for us to say this should be stayed. Most of the time, that is either a defense motion or it is a joint motion by the DOJ and the defense. For all the reasons that people have mentioned on the panel, um, there is a, you know, the, the the other side to this is the defendant is going to have to give discovery to the SEC. And also, just practically speaking, it's expensive to be litigating to, again, against the United States government in two forums in both the civil and criminal case. In my experience, most defense attorneys are, are more than happy to say, let's stay the civil case. Let's focus our attention on the criminal case. In particular, in this district, we are a little bit more open with discovery early than maybe some other districts where I don't know that a lot of defense attorneys look at their, their the discovery they got from DOJ and say, well, now we want to go and litigate with the SEC as well. So it, it's really kind of a non-issue. The SEC cases in this district, in my experience, usually do get stayed. Not always, but they usually get stayed. So Craig, how does that make you feel? You've got, uh, Jason's going to team up with the defense lawyers here and file a motion to stay your, your filed contested case, and he's, he's going he's to shut you down. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, how does it make me feel? I mean, you know, there's, 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 uh, there's, sorry. Right, there's, there's, there's times I'm relieved to have them go do the work uh, in the first instance. Obviously, if they prevail in their litigation, we typically have a pretty straightforward path uh, to either settlement or a motion for summary judgment, you know. But yeah, you know, we, we're the plaintiff. We never, we never bring those motions. We never consent to those motions, we just take no position because we're the plaintiff, we have our case ready you know, to go and we're ready to proceed. So, you know, but on the other hand, there are advantages to our case by allowing the criminal case to go forward first. So, sort of, in order to avoid sort of the public optic of filing a motion to stay Greg's case, he's ready to go, would you ever just consider picking up the phone call and say, hey Greg, why don't you just stand down for a little while? You can't do that when the case has been filed. So they're in front of a federal district court judge. They have a you know a case number. Like they're gonna, they have to go forward with their case. We do have conversations where we're both in an investigation where we might say, you know, SEC is ready to do X. They're ready to move forward on something, and we're not quite ready. And we think that that might have an effect on our criminal investigation. We may say. Can you wait to do that until we complete some additional investigative steps? We don't like to do that because we, you know, the SEC has their own mandate, their own mission. We don't want to get in the way of that. But like that happens from time to time where we might say, okay, before you do that, can you give us time because there's some investigative steps that we want to take? But that's a whole different ballgame. If they filed their case, like we either got to get in there and stay it or we got to get out of their way. Okay. All right. Th thanks for that. Let's pivot now to the to the Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment issues, which are uh, sometimes very tricky from a from a defense perspective. So, so Kit, you know, what are the, what are some of the facts and circumstances you look to? The considerations of the factors in deciding whether to advise a client. Uh, let's let's say in an, Greg's conducting an investigation, nothing's filed. Under what circumstances would you advise a client to take the fifth? When you know, when we know that there is a pending criminal investigation um, parallel on the same issues, you really have to put that investigation first, um, and your client can take the fifth. In most instances, there's an ability, uh, you know, caveat. That's a, in most instances, there's the ability for your client to turn that around at trial and. Uh, decide to testify, and so caution is always the better situation in those instances. Um, you know, in discovery as well, um, so to the extent that you're producing documents um, in that civil litigation, to the extent that it's moving forward, hasn't been stayed. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, I think Jason's point of the stay, just to harken back to that, is not always, right? I mean, we can look at Recently, Theranos, the Balwani piece, Sonny Balwani, the judge stayed it in part and objected to certain subpoenas, but didn't stay the case as a whole. Uh, another SEC matter. Um, and sometimes the SEC actually chooses to withdraw its case if there isn't a stay and it's gonna negatively impact the criminal case. But in those matters that are moving forward, at least until the stay is granted, um, you do have to really think about what your client's um, exposure is going to be in the criminal matter and not to use, not to allow the criminal authorities to use his or her statements uh, against them in that subsequent criminal trial. And I think that's just paramount. What are some of the, just, just maybe a quick, quick fly over here, so some of the benefits of invoking versus some of the benefits of, uh, of testifying? The, the benefits and the risks of, of the two Well, I mean, the benefit of invoking, obviously, is that the government is going, isn't going to be able to use your client's statements against them. The risk, I think Alec is going to talk to this as well, is just the negative inference in the right. civil proceeding. If you don't have the opportunity down the road in the civil action to, uh, to testify and withdraw your uh, invocation, then that obviously is a, is a big risk. I think the other part is the government just doesn't get to know your client. Um, and those of us who are privileged to represent good corporations, good people, um, sometimes we want the government to hear from them directly. And, and I feel bad that they can't understand, have an opportunity to hear the person's side of the story. So what's the, what's the adverse inference, Alec, that Kit alluded to? 
Right. So, so that means that the SEC has the ability to, you know, have an adverse inference drawn as to the facts where the uh, the defendant invoked the fifth, right? So, so they're basically able to hold it against uh, the the defendant that uh, uh, invoked the fifth. I mean, I had this happen to me when I was at the SEC. Uh, a guy uh, took the fifth during investigative testimony, and and just to show his contempt for me, he put his feet up on the table and <laughs> read the Wall Street Journal while he invoked the fifth for a couple hours. Uh, but then he took it back when we got into litigation uh, and testified at trial. So so to Kit's point, you know, I think you always have that option as a defendant, but you got to live with the adverse inference as a basis for the civil case against you. How sure, how sure is that option if you invoke in the investigation? How sure is the option that you'll be able to t testify at trial if it goes that far, notwithstanding the earlier invocation? Is that, is that? Greg, I mean, I yeah, you, you might Steve, know better. I, I mean, I don't, I, I've not like surveyed the law on this or anything like that, but in my experience, the judge is gonna let the defendant yeah. testify. I think, I, I, but I think the real issue is whether or not the judge is going to let me in my examination of him, you know, when, you know, you, you know, when you testified, blah, 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 sir, you know, that, that isn't what you said the first time I asked you that question. The first time I asked you that question, you invoked your Fifth Amendment right against incrimination because your answer would have incriminated you. Isn't that right? And, um, and, you know, and I obviously the defendant would be motivated to keep that testimony out. And that would be, I think, the real fight. I'd be very surprised if a judge you know, the guy's sitting there and the judge says, absolutely not, you can't take the witness, you know, you can't get on the witness stand. Okay, fair I enough. I think the case law on that is really about timing. I mean, it's how yeah. late you as the defense lawyer say, my client's going to change. The only so thing can I want to point... So the earlier yeah. the invocation, the greater the likelihood of an ability to testify at trial? No, I no, think no, the, no, later, no. The, the, the later yeah. the, you withdraw it, the greater risk you're running. Okay, I'm right, sorry, right, that's right. what I meant. To, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. It. No, I was just going to add on the negative inference part, let's not forget civil actions that are not government, not the SEC, they're private litigation, shareholder, yeah, derivative, whatever, that negative inference can still be a problem. Yes, okay. Do you care, one way or the other, whether somebody takes the fifth in Greg's investigation? Uh, it doesn't have any evidentiary value for us. So, I mean, I would maybe prefer that they did talk to Greg and say something, because that could have evidentiary value for, <laughs> for the department. But um, it's a constitutional right. It doesn't have an, any evidentiary value, so it doesn't do anything either way for us. Okay. Bruce is going to take my head off if we go beyond another minute and yep. 45 seconds. But <laughs> just very quickly, let's end where we started with Jason's distinction between a joint and a parallel investigation. From a defense perspective, if you can cast the successfully cast the investigation as joint, does that get you greater access to information than if it's parallel? Yes, I think as he described earlier, yeah. Then then we have broader ability to get access to discovery if it's deemed to be a joint investigation. Yeah. So I, I would. And you, you agree with that? That's well, why they're so. Careful I don't mean to put you on the to, spot to have it I, come across that way. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I will tell you, practically speaking, probably not. Like at least how cases are litigated here in Chicago, we produce a lot of material. We obtain a lot of material from the SEC. So uh, you, may, you might get some finding. And even in when a judge says this is a joint investigation, it's generally limited to the parts of the investigation that are joint. So for example, yeah. an interview. So yes, in the abstract maybe, but practically I don't think, not, not so much cases here. I don't know that that's, that's the same in cases in other districts, though. I'll just say that. OK, great. OK, we are at the end of our time. Let me thank the audience. You've been terrific. We really appreciate your time and attention. And uh, it's really been an honor being on the panel with each of you. So th thanks for the privilege. Bruce? And thank you. For